Hey guys, it's Michael here from FlySight, and this is a very brief introduction to aerodynamics. First, we're going to define a couple of things. Most of us are probably familiar with airfoils. Uh, an airfoil is the cross-sectional shape of the wing. The relative wind is the direction of movement of air relative to the airfoil. In this diagram, we can see the relative wind, shown by the red arrow and also a couple of streamlines uh, showing the flow of air around the airfoil. The angle of attack is the angle between the relative wind and the cord line of the airfoil. And that's the dotted line in this diagram going from the leading edge to the trailing edge. When air flows around the airfoil, it generates an aerodynamic force, uh, whose magnitude and direction are shown here with the green arrow. We can divide this force into two parts, lift and drag. Lift is the part of the aerodynamic force which is perpendicular to the relative wind, and that's shown with the red arrow. Drag is the part that's parallel to the relative wind, and that's shown with the blue arrow. Lift and drag depend on the angle of attack, so if we increase the angle, they'll change. Here, the lift has increased quite a bit but the drag has only increased a little. If we increase the angle of attack a little more, then again we see another increase in lift and a small increase in drag. This trend continues until the wing stalls. And when the wing stalls, the air stops flowing smoothly over the top of the wing, lift starts to drop off, and the drag increases quickly. We can plot how lift and drag change as we increase the angle of attack. As we saw in the last few slides, lift increases steadily until the wing stalls. Drag increases slowly at first, and then increases rapidly once the wing stalls. There are a couple of important benchmarks here. One is minimum drag. In this case, minimum drag occurs when the wing is pointed directly into the relative wind. In a wingsuit, we'd usually be getting close to minimum drag if we dive with our head and shoulders pointing into the wind. The other benchmark is maximum lift. This occurs just before the wing stalls. We usually experience this as a feeling that we're balancing on a ball. Near the stall point, the wing becomes more difficult to control. Now we're going to look at this another way. We're going to produce something called the drag puller. We start with the wing pointing straight into the wind so that it only produces a little drag and no lift. When we tilt the wing a little bit, the total aerodynamic force, which is shown at the green arrow, changes. We're going to draw a dotted green line which follows the tip of that arrow as we continue to increase the angle of attack. Let's bump the angle up again. And again. And again. When we get to the stall point, the green line starts bending over to the right because drag is going up quickly, but lift is not. If we take the plot and we pull it away from the diagram, this is what it looks like. This is the drag puller. The green line shows lift and drag measurements that we've made as we've tilted the wing from zero angle of attack near the bottom up to the stall point. The drag puller shows us the relationship of lift and drag for this airfoil. As it happens, when we're far away from the stall point, the plot follows a nice curve which we've shown here is a black line. This is great because we can replace all those measured points with a single theoretical curve. We still have the two benchmarks we noted before, minimum drag on the left and maximum lift at the top. We also have a new benchmark and that's the maximum L over D. We can draw this as a line that passes through the origin at the bottom left and touches the black curve at exactly one point. 
As it turns out, the slope of this line is equal to the maximum glide ratio achievable with this airfoil. So why do we care about this? We can use the drag puller to determine if we're flying for time or distance or speed. If we take a single moment in a jump, we can calculate lift and drag at that point. Based on where the point is in this plot, we can tell what mode of flight we're in. So for example, if we plot that point and it comes up down here, then we're flying for speed. If it comes up here, then we're flying for distance. And if it comes up here, then we're flying for time. You can see when you look at this plot that when we're flying for speed, we're aiming for the lowest possible drag. When we're flying for time, we want the highest possible lift. And when we're flying for distance, we want to be as close as possible to that pink dot, which gives us our optimal glide ratio. We can also use the drag polar to predict what force an airfoil will produce at any angle of attack. So for example, when we look at this curve, we can say that for this angle of attack, we'll always have this much lift and this much drag. I've left out a couple of details here to keep things as simple as possible, but what I want you to see is that this curve can predict the behavior of a complex airfoil. To review, the lift and drag produced by an airfoil depend on the angle of attack, we can visualize this relationship using a drag polar plot, and the drag polar summarizes the most important characteristics of the airfoil. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know.